그러면 아, so important, so important. Okay, uh, you're gonna have to turn to your Bibles. I know I really, I'm, I'm gonna work on a new habit. Turn it over a new leaf, and uh, the new leaf is lots of Bible, lots of Bible, lots of having it wide open. Part of it is I'm not gonna have the big passage up here today. <clears throat> uh, I'm gonna have just some of the couple of points up there that will keep us on track. And there's a bunch of Bibles on the shelf there, Ben. Lower shelf. And I'm going to kind of stick close to my book. Okay, go to 1 Samuel 16. Matt, why are we going to 1 Samuel 16? How does this fit? Well, honestly, we're just going to start reading, and then I'm going to try to make it make sense later. <laughs> we're going to do it backwards. We're going to do it backwards today. But you'll need your Bible because we're going to keep referring to it as we go. We are in the story of... Somebody tell me as soon as you get there. David. David. In the story of David. And so 1 Samuel 16. You know, it would be great to talk about Goliath. Okay, I'll... Goliath is dead. Goliath is dead. Yeah, Goliath is dead. <laughs> Hey, Ella, who killed it? Who killed Goliath? Who, who killed him? David. Did he chop off his head? Yeah, chopped off his head. <laughs> she liked acting out that part. We didn't actually teach her to act it out. Really I'm calling it spiritual. Uh, and it's not just because Ella loves that story, but. It's, it's time for us to um, to cover some some other ground to help us get to the same place. Okay. So let's just read. We're not going to be able to read the whole thing. There's a lot we're going to get out of. We're going to have way too much to talk about today. Just off of what we read, but we're going to we're going to get into it. Okay. So just the just the anointing passage all the way up to 13. Here we go. The Lord said to Samuel, "How long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him?" from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to the sac come to sacrifice to the Lord and invite Jesse to the sacrifice. And I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came out to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab, the oldest, and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him, as in this will be the king. Seven. But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't look on his appearance, or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, uh, There remains yet the youngest, uh, but uh, he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, which means reddish, and had beautiful eyes, and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Okay. A 
I wasn't, I wasn't idly talking last week when I opened the door on praying for and fighting for our families. I didn't idly opened that up. That was somewhat calculated. How, how do we, how can we take back other territory if we still have territory in our own house to take? Is that fair? How do we make progress while we're still hindered here? It's not meant to be mean sounding, it's just a fact, isn't it? Isn't that just a fact? Didn't Jesus say that he was about to go to the cross and he said, the ruler of this world is coming, but he has nothing in me. So there is this spiritual principle where, and we see it in the story of the conquering of the land, where getting the Amalekites and the Canaanites and the Philistines out of the land allows for the fullness of what God wanted for the land. So here we are. Um, I want to be able to give our families a tool here this morning and over the next little while. Tools to keep our territory. Can I get an amen? amen. And, and expand our territory. To keep and expand the territory that God has in our, in our home. Because if we're talking about uh, us being a family, us being the house of God, well, you know what? Most of your time is spent in your house. <laughs> and then God gives us some burdens and opportunities to carry other people and form a bigger house out of Him. But we're going to learn how to handle bigger houses in a smaller house called our house. Well, you say, I'm not, I don't have a family, except the family member. I'm a young man. I'm not the patriarch of a household. Well, you know what? One day you're going to be. Daniel, one day you're going to be. God's going to give you a beautiful Brazilian girl. You can marry. You're going to have Brazilian babies. And you're going to have to learn how to keep and hold the territory of God for your family. Right? Isn't this true? Isn't this true? So what we're going to see in the story of David is we're going to see the Israelites hadn't kicked out all of the, out, of all of the ites out of the land. You know where the Philistines lived? In Israel. In Israel, along the coast. Some of the best land. Some of the most uh, fertile land. Philistines moved in there, that was their land. And you know whose land it was supposed to be? It's Israel's. And those Philistines didn't get kicked out until David came. God used David to finish off the expansion of the land that was properly God's. Can we see spiritual principles in this? So in preparing the land, we see the biblical character God used to clear the land, remain for him, spread the vision of the house of God at the end of his life, saved up a lifetime of money for the spoils of war for the house of God would dwell in, and whose character showed extraordinary understanding of God's desires was all David. So we're going to get a lot out of David. We're going to get a lot out of David. And the first step is the first verse. Watch this. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I'll send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. <sighs> okay. This is my only disclaimer. What I'm going to say today is all supposed to just be true. So don't act like I'm poking at you too much. <laughs> okay. Can I just say true things this morning? Okay. Okay. God became tired of the leadership of his house called Saul. You know who that pokes at? Me. That pokes at Matt Ends, one of the leaders of God's house. You know this verse is for Matt Ends? <laughs> God became tired of the leader of his house. How long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? I'm going to go get another king. You know how often that sits in my mind as one of the leaders of God's house here? That God might have to replace me if I need to be replaced? True or false? True or false? True or false? Can we just lay that out right there? That is a true point. How many times in history has that happened? It's meant to be silver. That when it's God's house, guess who's supposed to get his way? 
God's bad. And so God appoints shepherds, He appoints leaders, in order to get what He wants. Wow. So God rejected Saul. Can I just turn it on to our houses? Whose house is our house? Our, our homes. 247 Aspen Street. Your house. Who's the, who's the God over that house? Supposed to be God God. So in that same way, God appoints or allows or endows. So our house is not supposed to be just our house. We are under the authority of the Lord if our house is the Lord's house, our individual home. And God wants to have a house that is for Him in our house. 247 Aspen. It's His house. And God reserves the right to help kings along and remove kings and put kings in. So if God's going to rule over our individual house, how much more does He want to rule over our church house, how much more does he want to rule over everything. But what did, what did Saul do? And we're not going to do a whole big study on Saul today. Do you know what? Do you know who had the best son in this whole series of stories? Remember Jonathan? Jonathan was an amazing guy. Him and David were like this. They were buds. They had a, a soul that was knit to each other. They were of a kindred spirit. They bonded. And guess who Jonathan's dad was? Saul. Saul. Failure. Fearful. Rebellious. Disobedient. Held on to the kingship long after he knew that David had received it. How did that happen? <laughs> you know what that's supposed to do? That's supposed to give us hope in our parenting. <laughs> that's supposed to give us hope in our parenting. That if dang King Saul could put out Jonathan, then it is God has a way to make things work out when they probably shouldn't work out. Maybe Jonathan had a good mother. Yeah. Maybe he had a good mom. Maybe he had, yeah, you know what, maybe so. Could your grandma praying for him? You know who had terrible sons? Terrible sons. Samuel. Samuel. Well, David too. But right now, in this immediate story. 1 Samuel 8. Joel and Abijah were corrupt, bribe-taking, uh, immoral, and they were also leaders among Israel because they were Samuel's sons. So they were part of the service of the prophetic ministry there. And they were wicked. And that's part of why Israel asked for a king. Because they said, Samuel, you're getting old and your sons suck. So give us a king. You know what that says to Matt? Don't get too busy with the work of the Lord that you can't take care of your own house. <laughs> Does that speak to anybody else? Does that speak to anybody else? You know who did a good job in this story? Jesse, son of Obed. Jesse, the son of Obed. Because who was one of his sons? David. Where did David learn some of his basic skills of worshiping the Lord? and going to sacrifices, and presenting offerings to the Lord. He got it from his dad. And when, and when Goliath and the Philistines show up in the next segment of the story, the oldest three sons of Jesse, they're right there. We're going to defend the name of the Lord. We're going to fight Israel's armies. Where did they get, where did they get that vigor from? Their dad, they got it. It's a family thing. Why did David want to fight? Because it was part, there was a family thing. Can I ask this question? Do our families know why we exist as a family? Can we say our family exists so that the name of the Lord will be great in the land? And then they come on board with that agenda. We as a family exist so that the Lord's name will be great in the land. Because then when the three oldest sons of Jesse hear that the Philistines want to take on Israel, they're there because they're part of the family. David wants to join them, but he's too young and he's watching the Speaks, doesn't it? Speaks, doesn't it? 
for you young men who are going to have families one day. You will win and require families one day. Will the family know why the family exists? Will they know? So Samuel did not order his house correctly. But isn't that interesting? God didn't hold it against Samuel. <laughs> can, can we hear that too? Can we hear that by the grace of God? In the end, Joel and Abijah had to live their own life. And God didn't depose Samuel for the actions of his kids. God didn't depose Eli for the actions of his kids. Isn't that grace? <laughs> Every man's sin is before the Lord and we're all going to have to And yet, the story of Saul says, we can still screw up and God will still give us a job. But as for me and my house, will we serve the Lord? You know what? Let's go to the next piece. Samuel 4. Let's read this one together. Samuel did what the Lord commanded. They're going to go do a sacrifice. It's kind of a cover story so that he can sneak over and anoint the king. And the elders of the city came to meet Samuel, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? Now they came out of the city trembling. They came out of the, tre the city trembling. Anyone ever wondered when you read that, what's going on here? Well, when, when Samuel spoke, it says that not a word of his fell to the ground. You know what that means? It means when he was speaking in his in his role, you were hearing from the Lord. You were hearing from the Lord. And it's kind of scary to be around someone like that. <laughs> because everything they say is from the Lord. And they better listen. They better listen and there's a, 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 some fret, you know. It's not always comfortable. Because what if he came to bring judgment to the city? <laughs> what if he came to say, well, the Lord has declared that this city is um, not pleasing in his sight. So they come out trembling. Can I ask this question? Not that we're going to go toward this the whole thing. But isn't there a place where that's really cool? Where the representation of the Lord in Samuel was so powerful that the people of the land knew that God was with that one. And it, it set them on... Edge, awareness, carefulness. Does God still want that? To have the representation of his life. Can we just do that? To have the representation of his life so powerfully in a people that the surrounding people know that the Lord is with them. Does God still want that? Did God have that in the book of Acts? Did God have that over the periods of time in history? Yes, he did. Does God still want that? So it's still possible, my friends. It's still possible. It's possible for the world to tremble when the feet of those who carry God's name approach. It's still possible. That's all we're going to say on that one. We might have that same relationship with God. Now, Samuel learns a new thing in this story. Did you notice that? You think for all of his years and all of his uh, wisdom, that uh, he would have uh, learned everything. But this was a new experience. Okay, so we'll just start in verse 6 there. Uh, when they came together, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him, the king, the new king. But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as a man sees. The Lord looks on the outward appearance, but the man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And they went to the second son, and no, the third son, and no, seven of the sons, and no. And so here's Samuel, and he'd only anointed one other king. He had anointed a tall, handsome Saul, who looked the part. So, for some reason, Samuel was still in that mental mode. That when God appoints someone to, to, to serve on his behalf, he appoints good-looking dudes. And you know... I'll just tell you my other thought. I'm tall. Sometimes I think, shoot, what if I'm a Saul? <laughs> I sometimes thought that. Chris, have you ever thought that? Uh, ben, you ever thought that? Shoot, we're tall. Shoot. If we were all built, we'd be just fine, right in the Lord's 
<laughs> He's not here to defend himself, Mel. I can get away with that. <laughs> Wish we were all there. I do wish that Okay, this is proof that you can live your whole life with God and still learn about His character and nature. Isn't that good to hear? We can live our whole lives and still learn things about God's nature and His character. And Samuel knew something new that day. And uh, what did he learn? He learned that what God was looking for in His people is the heart. What God was looking for in His people is the heart. So all you ugly people in here, <laughs> but David has beautiful eyes. Let's go talk about that. But he's a That just means he had a little bit reddish tinge. Right. So Leah's saying everyone has to be beautiful. Well, I don't know. David, it didn't say David was ugly. He was saying he was handsome and modest. Actually, it does say he was handsome. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. All the women thought he was pretty good. Well, you got a lot yeah. of wives on there, though. Um, which we won't talk about today. We're not going to get into that today. Okay. He was looking for the heart. And, and you know what? As beautiful as David was, he was the remnant of the family. <coughs> right? Samuel has come. We came trembling. He invited us to a feast. Let's all go. All except the one who is always rejected. The one who's the little one. The one who's the best. David heard that there was a sacrifice to the Lord. And he got told, you don't get to come meet Samuel, the prophet of God. You get to stay with the sheep. We're not going to leave a servant, even though all the sons were invited. <laughs> we're going to leave the son. So you're going to stay there. So have you ever seen Kung Fu Panda? Yeah. Okay. Pai really wants to go to the coronation of the dragon warrior. Right, Nathan? He wants to go see him. So he disobeys his dad and he, he gets to the top and he gets inside the courtyard and the story goes. David had every right to sneak in. And yet he was humble. He was obedient. He did what he was told. He trusted that God would arrange things. Doesn't that just prove the heart of the character so much more? That when God picked the future king, the quality of humility in David was exemplified already just by the very fact that he obeyed and stayed where he was told to be. But doesn't that show something about all of our hearts? They're in the story, all their other hearts? How did they see David? He'll never be king. He's not that important. Let that be a warning to all of us, right, about picking people based on what we think. <laughs> God doesn't pick people based on what we think. And you know what? You know what? If you view yourself as lowly, if you view yourself as insignificant, if you view yourself as not worthy of doing great things for God, you are a prime candidate for responsibility in the kingdom of God. No, but that's how everybody else feels. Okay, you had a different. Let me say it again. If we think that we're the insignificant one, if we think that we're the ruddy one, if we think that we're the right. Watch out. You're just the kind that God likes to choose for his services and missions. Other watch out. Suppose you're Elia. Watch out. What did you think that because you're tall and handsome, like Chris is, that you deserve the kingship? God will look over you. You don't deserve nothing in God's kingdom. You don't deserve anything in God's kingdom. God appoints by grace. And grace goes to the humble. Grace goes to the humble. The foolish is used to shame the wise. That's a spiritual principle, isn't it? It's true all through the Bible. The weak things, the lowly, God uses to shame the strong and the wise. It's true for David. You might be taken by a Samuel one day and sent to shepherd some of God's people. 
because you don't want to doesn't mean you won't get called. Where did where did David where did David get his qualification? Guys, every future work that God will do with us has a proving ground. You guys understand that? You understand that? Every future work is based on a past proving ground. Where was David's proving ground to be a king in Israel? Taking care of sheep. What's the lifestyle of one who watches sheep in that era? It's you and sheep. You and sheep. And sheep need to eat grass. So it's not in a city, because there's no grass in the city, so you're all alone with you're constantly sheep. Uh, and night comes, and you're still all alone with the sheep. You have to be vigilant. And your brain is in gear all the time. So it's not like it's an old thing, it's something you got a lot of responsibility. Mm -hmm. And you get a sense of compassion, because it's like when the lion comes to steal a sheep, you're like, I just spent all day and all night for years with that animal. And the shepherd goes out to find the one lost sheep while the other ones are safe in the pen. And learn the value of one. It was a perfect proving ground. You know what God says a couple times, actually, in Chronicles and um, Kings? God says, you know what, David? I took you from the flock to shepherd my people, Israel. In other words, he learned lessons as the shepherd that were going to be valuable shepherding the nation. Now, can I point something else out? Oh. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. There is a proving ground of quiet corners, the proving ground of ignored places, the proving ground of no one is looking, Proving ground of I have no respect before my peers. They ignore them. The proving ground of he who sees me is the Lord. And I love him. Did you guys know that St. Patrick had his proving ground among sheep too? Did you guys know that? Did you know that St. Patrick was a shepherd? Yeah, it's in his book. He actually wrote a memoir. So you can read his memoir. It's not really long. It's like 30 pages. But he had his proving ground as a shepherd. And I would pray as many as a hundred prayers a day to the Lord, is how he says it. Long hours alone. Isn't that what David had? Long hours alone. Long hours quietly contemplating the glory of the God of Israel. Long hours in silence. Is that a harp? We'll learn about that in the next story. He learned to write music to the Lord. Yeah. Quoting the scriptures, meditating on the law. Can I say something? And I am totally poking at every young person in this room. But I am afraid that our iPhone generation does not know science. And that one of the chief casualties of that is it might cost us being a future David for God. Because there's a proving ground of being able to sit with the Lord for long periods of time. It's just true. It's just true for all of us. And the problem with the constant... Some parent give me a head nod. <laughs> that there's a constant attention grab that suddenly the mind no longer knows how to get to that place where it can just hear from God and be with Him, and be with him in silence. Thank you, my <laughs> I'm not saying burn your iPhone, but I am saying God looks at the heart that's looking at Him. And if we're never in silence, it's going to be hard to Taking time to be silent. Taking time to be holy. All David had was trees, rocks, hearts, and sheep. But if you've had silent seasons, and the glory of the Lord is rising up in your heart, don't expect to hide there forever. Don't expect to hide there forever. Okay. This is toward the end, so we're getting toward the end. 
And Jesse sent for David and he was brought in. Now he was ready, had beautiful eyes and handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Rome. So imagine the scene. You're not the king, 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 you're not the king. Where is the last one? He shows up. Everyone's standing around. You're the king. So we'll see in the story's future that there was a bit of jealousy among the brothers. And yet God didn't spare David from them. It wasn't Samuel goes off to a quiet corner. Hey, sneak around behind this wall with me. You're the king. No, nope. the seven other brothers, the father. And you know what a king, you know, you know how you treat a king? You bow down, you serve, you don't worship them, but now they're the boss. And seven older brothers and the father, just watch, oh my word, this guy's going to be my boss. <laughs> no more noogies. No more teasing, no more sending them to the flock, although that still happens. Isn't that interesting? God knows how to vindicate us for our humility. Can we hear that in the story? David's humility all those years was vindicated finally, and he didn't have to do anything. God arranged it. Can we stay in that place of humility long enough for God to vindicate our obedience to him? And God will eventually allow the vindication to show up. Okay. And then what? The Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. Can we hear this? What is, okay, God saw David. His heart was right. He was qualified. He had training in shepherding. And he was going to be qualified to... Um, shepherd the nation of Israel. And yet, God still thinks that that's not enough. It's not enough that we think we're ready to serve God. It's not enough that we have strength in our own soul that we can serve God. It's not the strength of a man that God's looking for. It's the vessel that's the man. This is why he can take the humble, the lowly, the weak, the ruddy, and elevate them to kingship. Because he's going to take them as a vessel, a cup. And he's going to put in that cup what he wants out of that cup. The wisdom of the Spirit. So, far be it from us to forget that God gives us a Holy Spirit. And that if we do not minister by that Spirit... We are not ministering for the Lord's sake. We're using our own soul strength. That's not what God wants. For all of David's qualifications, in the end, all he was was a qualified vessel. <laughs> Can we hear the encouragement in that? David didn't need his own strength. David didn't need his own wisdom. David didn't need his own wisdom and power and ability. He just needed to be a that's supposed to make us feel good. That's supposed to make us feel good. That God doesn't call the equipped, He equips the call. God doesn't call the strong, He strengthens the call. All we do is receive. And honestly, how is He going to have enough strength to face not just that giant, but did you know there were other giants after Goliath? Did you know that? There was going to be multiple giants. Did you know that you're going to have to endure the battles. You're going to have to survive rebellions. He's going to have to live in the desert for 10 years. He's going to have to receive, haunted by Saul. He's going to have to receive from God a vision of an earthly temple that would be built and remain humble. And he was going to be king. How was he going to survive all of that tension and stress and exaltation and without the Spirit of the Lord. So here we are again. 
Are we in that place where we receive from God what, what we need for where we're at? So now we're back to guarding our house. Now we're back to protecting the territory of our house. Now we're back to how do we keep and hold the territory of God. Far be it from us that we would minister our house without the anointing of the Spirit of God. Guys, we got to know that we know that God has set us apart for a certain work. Because when it got tough on David, he went back and remembered dripping oil in the presence of his brother. He went back and remembered a marked moment when God said, you're going to be my king. Because how else was he going to survive the caves for 10 years? How else was he going to survive being hunted by his, what he thought was being a loyal leader, got hunted by him. When he had to be a madman, or the leader of the Philistine army. How was he going to survive? He knew that he was called because of that moment, because of that moment. we got to be put into motion by a force of divine will and energy. We've got to have a power on us so that it's the Lord's power. How else can David enter the battle with Goliath with this kind of flippant confidence? He had the spirit of so, my friends, we've all got a call to our own house. <laughs> we've got a call to our own household, don't we? Our own house. Suppose you're a kid in this room. <clears throat> I'm not called to defend my house. Oh, you're not. Really? You can just get into anything you want, kid, and it won't affect your house? No. You have a role, too, dear child. You have a role, too. But for us who have received the responsibility, God does. He's called us. He's given us. He's given us an anointing. He's given us a territory. In that, though, can we go here for a moment? Just like Jesse had to let the three oldest sons go to battle for the name of the Lord. And just like Jesse had to let David be the king in Israel. Are we willing that if our house is going to be for the Lord, are we willing to let our kids be for the Lord in the sense that God can take them from our home? God can send them to dangerous lands. God can take them away from us, from our relationship with them, and have them engaged in places and people far away. Because if the house is going to be the Lord's house, then the Lord decides what He does with His house. Are we willing to allow Him to take our family members and send them to the dangerous Goliaths? What if we have a hold on them? What if we say, no, you're not allowed, Lord. You can't take my family and do those things with them. You can't do that either. If it's going to be the Lord's house, it's going to be the Lord's house. All right, my friends. That's all I got for us. What do you got? What do you think? Does this story speak? Yet at the point where the story itself speaks to taking back the territories and defending the land kind of a thing, although that's going to be part of what we need to do. But if we can borrow from the example of Jesse, we don't got a whole lot of them, but we can infer some things based on his kids. We can give our kids a reason to live. We can give our house a reason to be. And we can give our house here, our collective house, of whom we are all stones, living stones. That this house, does it exist for the name of the Lord? May it be so? Yes, I think it does, but yes, we have to say it, we have to state it. Assuming that our kids are just going to pick up on some of this stuff is a little risky. 
Because if it's not worth saying and everything else is worth saying, then they're going to pick up on what we say too. I know we got to set examples, I know they got to follow our example, but we never say it. How will they ever say it? How will it be a principle that they can live? No. Can we say here now this house, this, it's not the church building, not the church service, this body of people, can we say that it exists for the name of the Lord in this area? I think so. Because why else would God have placed it here? It exists so that the Lord can get what He wants out of it and out of our hands. God means to make war. Can we get that out of the story? God means to make war. God likes war. He likes it. He calls himself a mighty warrior. He's got swords that come out of his mouth. He's not afraid of war. Is this house afraid of conflict? Is your house afraid of conflict? Is your house afraid of conflict, Ben? and then we can be wrapped up. And the Lord's Prayer was saying because it talks about your kingdom come and will be done. And we're going to say that together as a group. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily life and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, ever and ever. Amen. Amen. <laughs>